So last week after church, I went home because I hadn't had enough church, and I joined a Zoom call with four other people, three from Berlin, Germany, one from Paris, France, and me from Sarasota, Florida. And what were we doing? Well, we prayed together, and we shared the Eucharist together. And the call was put together by a group I discovered on Twitter and had followed and wanted to join one of their phone calls, but then they got all delayed and messed up by the pandemic, and plus there's a time difference and all of that, but I knew I could make it last Sunday at 2. And the group's name is the Urban Monastics. Their motto is simple and powerful. It is present with God, present with others. And after we prayed and shared the Eucharist, we had a time of discussion led by Paul Prince, who's this really cool guy who is one of the founders of the Urban Monastics. And we discussed two questions that he put forward for us. The first one was, how do we respond with hope to the world as it is? And the second was, how do we share hope with others? It was that rich discussion last Sunday that inspired the new sermon series I'm starting today. Because I realized, we all realized on the call, that we struggle with how to respond to the world as it is with hope. And maybe we struggle then, therefore, with how to share hope with others. And during our discussion, Paul said some things that I hope we can explore during this sermon series the next couple of weeks. He said, responding to the world with hope takes practice, takes discipline. He said it must be cultivated, the title of this series, like any spiritual practice, akin to cultivating the ability to be thankful in our lives. But we often talk about that more as a spiritual practice than we do being hopeful in our lives. In our discussion, we concluded that sometimes feeling hope takes time to develop. It doesn't happen overnight. And that often hope and hard work go together. And that we struggled during this conversation to come up with clear answers to the question of, of how we personally share hope with other people. One person in the discussion said, you know, it, it isn't as simple as giving somebody some money or a piece of bread. Although that can be part of giving hope. Another participant said, quite honestly, he didn't even know if he had ever had if he had ever shared hope with people. Now that he thought about it, but he said he had been around people who had shared hope with him, simply through their presence. And while I was listening, and I heard that comment, I said, "Hope is kind of." One of those things you know it when you see it or when you feel it. And I imagine Jesus was that kind of person. And so my ears perked up when Paul later said the story of the raising of Lazarus. When really explored, that long, long story that Libby just read, when really explored and picked apart and looked at, has the capacity to transform our very image of God in a way that helps us better understand in a more real way what it means to believe the hope of God. And if that is true, and I believe it is, then this magnificent, troubling, contradictory, very human story with a very human Jesus at the center of it can begin to teach us how to better cultivate real, substantive, God-given hope in our lives. So for the next two weeks, we are going to use scripture, that scripture, we 
just heard, we're going to use prayer, we're going to use readings, we're going to use music, and we're going to use experience to help us cultivate hope, as we're doing this morning. When Adam sings, lean on me, as we think about the hope of being present for each other, <coughs> that cultivates hope. The benediction, Lori and Tatiana will help us sing in a few minutes, is a benediction of hope that we will sing at the end of the next two services as well. And so I hope that the story of the raising of Lazarus will cultivate hope for us in new and surprising ways as we move through this series. Sometimes, I'm pretty sure everybody, I think everybody in here will agree, that sometimes imagination plays a big part in finding hope, seeing things in a new way. So I want to share with you how some artists have viewed the story of the raising of Lazarus, just to pique your imagination now that you've heard the story. So the first one is from a guy named Rembrandt. I think we've all heard of him, right? And I think you can see, hopefully, that picture. So it's pretty simple. There's Lazarus. And there's Jesus with the traditional hand up, indicating that this miracle, this raising is happening. And then you see the people and their expressions. And this dude almost looking a little afraid looking over there. But what's interesting about this one, because one of the interesting things to me about Lazarus is we just know very little about him before and after this. But in Rembrandt's time, it was often thought that he had been a soldier. And so you see up here, just barely a sword and some armor indicating that that was his life before this. Okay, let's go to the next one. Probably tell even not knowing the name who that is. <laughs> Van Gogh. So there are a lot of interesting things about Van Gogh's painting of this. One thing is that he based his painting on an etching uh, of another version of Rembrandt's painting that Van Gogh's brother Theo had brought to him and painted. Uh, Van Gogh painted it. This is the time that he was getting help for his mental illness. So there's some really interesting things about it. One thing is that's not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is not in this picture, Van Gogh's version. The spirit is in the sun and in the, the healing colors around it. These are actually two women that he knew from his life. He lived in the town of, how would you say it, Libby? Arles? A-R-L-E-S? Uh, Arles? Yeah. Thank you, that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these are actually two people that he knew, so, so Van Gogh put them in the picture. And if you can, it's hard <coughs> to see here, because I'm blocking it, but there's Lazarus. Now, what's interesting about Lazarus, if you know anything about Van Gogh and how he looked? He looks like him. He looks like him. He looks like him, with the ginger beard. And so Van Gogh, unlike Rembrandt, who is very... Uh, to him, it was very important to have Jesus at the center of it. For Van Gogh, the center of this story is Lazarus and his suffering and his healing. And that's Van Gogh's story, too. Now, this one is by Henry Osawa Tanner. And that is hard to see, I know. It looks a little blurry. And that is all my fault because I think I always do. <laughs> um, but he was an African American artist who. Uh, some consider uh, the, the father, in many ways, of African-American uh, painting. Um, and, and this picture in 1896 won a prize in Paris and, and kind of put him on the map as a, a painter. And so what's interesting in the raising of Lazarus is very similar to Rembrandt. He's got uh, Lazarus in the foreground. And then... Um, very well in this, but he is in there, 
in here. Well, isn't no, he the guy right. in the front? Looking. Oh, here, yeah, thank you, thank yes. you, there he is, yes. So he doesn't have the hands up the way that uh, Rembrandt had him, but he's very close to the action and very much in the picture. One other interesting thing about this is that this person back here is the only person who is a black person in the painting. And so it's believed that Tanner included him in that painting, sort of a little bit hidden in the back as a representative of how important Christianity has been to African Americans and how important African Americans has been, have been to Christianity. I think that's the end of that. No, no, I'm sorry, right, uh, Marlita Urakova. I could not find much more uh, about this except for she's a, uh, a painter in Bulgaria. She painted this in 2020. And what do you notice about this one? Women. Yeah, yeah. So a female Jesus, a female Lazarus. Very simple to me, a very, um, powerful kind of intimate portrayal of it and the expression of Lazarus fascinates me because it's almost like a what is going on here which is part of what Lazarus must be thinking in this story and of course you see him very bound together in the way that uh, Libby talked about and then the you know the hand up as the signal that uh, a sign that a miracle was happening all right that just gives you an idea of how how, uh, how many interesting ways this uh, heel is portrayed and has captured the imagination of people within and beyond Christianity. So now I just want to close with giving you just a, a, a few words about context of this story as we go forward. So you have sort of a framework to understand uh, where it is in the Gospels and, and the structure around it sort of help you as you uh, frame it as we look at going forward. So it is only found in the Gospel of John, um, not in the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, so that's significant. Um, doesn't necessarily tell us anything about um, whether it's true, whether it's authentic, those things, that there are things in the Gospel of John, even though it was written later, that clearly are authentic. And this story has a lot of elements that are similar to other stories in the Gospel. It is also one of the, uh, what's called one of the signs in the Gospel of John. And so John ties a narrative around uh, these signs, these stories uh, that, that show the power of Jesus. And so this is the sixth sign. It is the final sign in our understanding of it before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And some consider the resurrection the seventh sign. But what's interesting about these sign stories, and I just want to run, run, run this through uh, this with you. So you see there is a structure to these sign stories. Uh, so another one that would be a sign story is the, the wedding of uh, Cana and the creation of the wine when uh, they run out of it. So <coughs> run this through with me. You've heard the story from uh, Libby's reading it. So let's look at the structure of this sign story. So what is the what is the problem that's identified in this story early on? In the story that you read. Sick and dying. <laughs> Lazarus is sick and dying. That's one. Two, what is the expectation that Jesus will resolve the problem? What do they think he's gonna do? Well, you should hurry up there. Keep him from dying. Yeah. Hurry up. Hurry up, get there. <laughs> we know you can do it. What's the frustration with this resolution that people have. He stayed where he was for two right. more days and right. he come right away. Right. He, ta he takes he a couple more days to get there. And so then what's the sign itself? He died. But then what's the sign he brings that Jesus him to resurrection. Yeah. 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 He brings him back to life. So he he resolves that frustration by bringing him back to life in the story. And then the aftermath is that Jesus talks about what that means, why that is significant. And that ties into the signs having this theme that leads, when we get to uh, later in the Gospel, 2029 in John, so now at that point we're, we're past the death, we're past the resurrection, we're in the post-resurrection period, and uh, what do we know about Thomas that he's famous for in the scriptures? 
Yeah, he's doubting. Although he's not doubting in this story. In this story, he's like, let's go die with him. But in this later point, he is having trouble believing. And so Jesus says to him to that point, have you believed because you have seen me? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So part of that is blessed are us who have not seen with our own eyes the way people in the Gospels have. So you see, this story itself was designed to cultivate hope in the lives of people who would have been hearing it, reading it originally, in the lives of people who were either struggling to continue to believe, like Thomas, or were people who were brand new to considering believing in the hope of Jesus. Or people who were somewhere in between. So one question to think about is where are you on that spectrum of belief today in your life? So I think this is an important series to do to talk about hope because there are a lot of shallow understandings of how God works in our world and in our lives. There are understandings that may sound good in the moment, but when the challenge of responding really gets urgent in our lives to a situation where we are really struggling to find hope, these are ideas and concepts that often fail. In some cases, not only do they fail, they cause the opposite of hope. Now, I don't mean any denigration to anybody who may use some of these, uh, these phrases uh, at all. But I do want us to challenge why we use them based on this story. Here's some that I've heard in my personal life directed at me or, um, or I've heard other people say. Maybe some of us have said them. Things like it's all in God's plan. Things like don't worry, God's in control. Things like, well, she's in a better place. God never gives you more than you can handle. Anybody heard any of those? <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying there isn't, perhaps, and usually there is a kernel of truth in those common words to try to help people find hope and take heart. But I am saying that based on my personal experience and my, my work experience, not just in the ministry, but working with various kinds of people and various kinds of crises that those bite-sized platitudes are not enough to deliver us a hopeful response to our world as it is. One of the things that you can see in a story, one of these sign stories in the Gospel of John, is that they are always surrounded by a lot of talking by Jesus because platitudes don't work. So he wants people to understand what's happening in those moments of crisis to understand where God is in the midst of it. So they might see that hope. And so if you want to rethink some of those ideas that people tell you or maybe you are thinking yourself, I've got good news for you. We've got a story to help us do that. a little work. It doesn't happen overnight to change our understandings. But if you long for something more for yourself, and if you long to be able to help others who feel hopeless feel a little more hopeful, then stop by the next couple of weeks, here or online, and see what Jesus and his friends have to say about cultivating hope. Jesus style.